Um, I would now like to introduce Paul Hardwood, who's here with me on the stage. Paul has worked for many years in international and cross-border financial services. Uh, he was previously a chief actuary and during the early 2000s, a CEO of a dot-com company. Paul is currently the CFO of a small UK mutual company. Paul's interest, as you'll soon hear, is in making risk management useful in practice. He's a frequent contributor to the Actuarial Society and uh, conferences, and today's presentation is the development of risk management work, and in particular, how it affects culture at work. Over to you, Paul. Good morning. The idea that culture is important, if not vital, to a healthy financial services sector is pretty much universally accepted. It features in high-level pronouncements about how we should be managing our businesses. Yet, despite its importance, we have very little in our toolkits to allow us to be confident that we have a healthy culture or that we're moving in the right direction. This morning, I'm going to present an approach to understanding or assessing culture using just five questions. I suggest two how culture might then be managed using the ideas in the same five questions. It's an approach developed as a thought experiment in the face of absent or severely lacking ideas about what professionals can do to address the continual demands regarding this most slippery of subjects. I'll start by outlining some of the problems with statements about culture. Statements that simply don't match our experience, but which are seldom challenged. Then we'll get on to the five questions and how they might be used to assess culture before turning to culture management. On the surface, the question this presentation addresses is what can management do to understand and direct culture? At its heart, though, is a really tough question is it possible to manage culture in commercial organisations at all? It's always worth bearing this second question in mind. What if culture just happens? Starting then with what irks about existing culture statements. <clears throat> Here are three common definitions. It's slightly alarming that there's no settled definition of culture, particularly given the importance that regulators and commentators put on the concept. If we can't define culture, can we rationally manage it? The first definition here is quite common. It's handy, it's short, it fits our implicit ideas of culture. The second definition is interesting too and popular because it contains some truth about the nature of culture. I wonder though, that if it's true that culture is what happens when nobody's looking, why do we think that when we look, we'll discover the truth? The third is from Wikipedia and demonstrates just how vast a subject culture is. Describing culture is just as hard. I'm not aware of any quantifiable way to describe culture. For example, you can't say a firm it has 60% integrity or 80% creativity. But qualitative dis descriptions of culture, stories, are important, which is intriguing. Occasionally, I have to remind board members that the plural of anecdote is not data. Yet anecdotes are seemingly among the most persistent methods for communicating culture. Another word for story is fable or fiction. It's worth reflecting that the stories we tell about culture are, if not fictional, considered from a very particular point of view. Are they representative? Or is culture set by the exceptional incident or by behavior under stress 
and it's just not evident, it lies dormant in humdrum everyday situations. It's important to recognise that culture is not the only factor in the quality of an outcome. Individual action too is involved. People can behave in countercultural ways. In my head, I see an equation a little like this. In summary, how an individual interacts within the prevailing culture is important to outcomes. If the culture is strong, it might adjust an individual's action significantly. But if the action is strongly perpetrated by a dominant individual, the action overwhelms the culture and a countercultural outcome results. If the individual is stronger than the culture, the culture, sorry, the individual will win. In a crude way, perhaps this describes how in the healthiest cultures, bad things can happen, and why we find angels working in corrupt cultures. Apologies, this is a little contrived, especially for actuaries who use equations properly. The point is that culture is not a standalone solution. If people are determined, they will overcome culture. So culture alone will not stop the lone wolves, the Nick Leesons, the perpetrators behaving badly. But perhaps it can stop the LIBOR rigging, or the PPI, or the diesel emission scandals, where many people knew what was happening. The hope is that for those lone wolves, a strong culture might create the environment in which individuals get found out fast. And, if this is understood, such individuals might temper their behaviour. But if the individual is stronger, there is no guarantee that the culture will succeed. In the arms race of culture versus individual determination, there is no obvious winner. The equation also serves to question the regulatory response to culture. Regulators have focused heavily on incentives, on the basis that these drive the action of individuals, the idea being that those people will drive culture. But if culture is separate and independent from individual action, and if incentives work, then you could just drop the focus on culture and achieve the same result. Alternatively, if the regulator wants cultures to be so strong that malfeasance can't happen, managing incentives that drive individuals won't achieve that. The public pressure to address culture can sometimes seem circular. We are told that the right culture would have prevented the wrong behaviour. When we ask, what is the right culture? We're told it's one in which the wrong behaviour would not have happened. These sorts of paradoxes are not uncommon when the media or politicians deal with complex issues. Well-practiced sound bites emerge. Something must be done. This must not be allowed to happen again. There is little interest, however, in understanding the complexities. People like us have to solve the problems nevertheless. One solution is to publicise your culture and its fine qualities. This slide shows extracts from statements about culture published by a number of FTSE 100 financial services firms, some under the heading culture, some under the heading values. They are similar, probably too similar. We know, our own experience tells us, that every firm we've worked for is different. Why then are their culture statements so similar? Being hard about it, if they are the same, why not just have the regulator impose a standard financial services culture on all of us, and we can drop the pretense that each firm must offer something unique? Practically speaking, published culture statements are lovely, ambiguous, fluffy statements that are little more than PR. They're often not testable. They're labels which allow boxes to be ticked. Not in a cynical or corrupt sense, but they are responding like for like to the circular arguments about culture. Something must be done, so we did this. What more can we do? 
to ensure that the bad thing never recurs. These statements are used as hooks to allow board members to anchor their actions and thus tick CSR off the list. Sincerely, genuinely, but with no context or scale. And I would argue, therefore, no meaning. Yet every firm does have its own culture. So what should the culture statements really say if they were intent on describing the often small but important differences? Would they even be publishable? This is an area we'll come back to shortly. I was recently asked by the CRO of a very large insurer about the difference between culture and risk culture. Some text that he had written for his firm's report and accounts had been rejected on the basis that it was about culture, not risk culture. In this regard, I can do no better than highlight this text from a recent excellent report on risk culture. Early on, this group determined that there is little useful distinction between the terms culture and risk culture. You can create a distinction, but it's artificial, and artificial things don't tend to persist. Organisations don't have just one culture. That's probably a good thing. The culture of the sales team should be different from the culture of the actuarial department. Yet both have to coexist alongside other cultures. The culture of an organisation is not homogenous. There may well, however, be common threads. But just as the species of the Serengeti share a waterhole and have to survive, adapt and compete in a common environment, so the silos in an organisation share a purpose, usually commercial survival. But their cultural modes may be very different. Why then do boards persist in their high level universal statements, culture statements? Are they really just talking to and about themselves? Who are they trying to satisfy? For us here today, how are we to manage culture if culture is not common? There is an expression, fish are the only ones who don't know they swim in water. You may be blind to your own culture. A couple of examples. In the report on the Challenger shuttle disaster of January 1986, Professor Diane Vaughan recognised that contrary to early reports which had suggested poor diligence on the part of engineers, the engineers were found to be extremely conscientious and very focused on risk and safety. Culturally, though, they had normalised deviance. The team assessing the joints on the solid rocket boosters conducted analysis to find the limits and capabilities of joint performance. Each time, evidence initially interpreted as a deviation from expected performance was reinterpreted as within the bounds of acceptable risk. The abnormal was redefined as normal, as a result, among other reasons, of frequency. A recurrent failure culturally became accepted as what happens around here. What it actually typified was a fundamental weakness which led to Challenger exploding on the morning of January the 28th, 1986. Another example comes from the 1960s Stanford Prison Experiment, when 24 students assessed as mentally stable were randomly assigned roles as prisoners or guards and their subsequent activities observed. The shock finding of this experiment was how quickly those students acting as guards began to brutalise their captives. Yet it took an external party who came in midway through the experiment to recognise the horrific nature of what was playing out before them and to say, you must stop this now. It is unethical. It is dangerous. Even those professional observers who'd set up the experiment 
psychologists, psychiatrists, doctors had become drawn into the experiment and lost their grip on the context. How are we to assess, let alone manage, culture when being part of the culture may render our observations invalid? I'm not familiar with all of the tools available for assessing culture. Those I've come across, how well do they do? First, they tend to be high quality, thorough, and have a rigorous, usually academic, knowledge base. If you want to use them, you have to buy in to a particular philosophy, a view of human nature, or how people behave at work. Often, these approaches can be cynically characterised by management as the next fad, and so are not taken too seriously. The results from these tools can feel a little like horoscopes. Is your firm Libra with a hint of Scorpio? or Gemini through and through. The most important criticism is the lack of practical application. They tend to describe a state or a set of emotional characteristics without suggesting what managers have to do next to get the results they require. Finally, too much public comment on culture arises from reports on things that went wrong. These reports while usually thorough, take time to emerge. They describe how culture was. But we have to manage culture now. And while these August reports may contain some nuggets of wisdom, we can't wait. We have to understand today's culture now and take action now to manage it. In summary, the problem of culture includes the following. There's no testable definition. There is a reliance, possibly essential, on storytelling, on anecdote. There is an empirical idea that dominant individuals can overwhelm culture. Microcultures exist throughout. Assessing culture and cultural change, especially when you're in them, is hard. And we have to solve today's problems now with real-time data and a fast feedback loop. So what if management really wanted to understand culture? What if it really wanted to at least try to influence culture? Those small but meaningful differences between firms. Bearing all those problems in mind, I set out to develop an approach to culture assessment and management that was simple, addressed or bypassed the problems as much as I was able, and was practically useful. The result is a thought experiment using control type principles, control cycle type principles, and always having at the forefront what should management do next. I'm not an anthropologist, I have no academic expertise in this area. What I've tried to do is marshal some thinking and draw some threads together that might be useful in our actions to satisfy a regulatory requirement, one that's not going away and where there is a need for practical ideas. One principle sits underneath this work. In 1964, Eric Byrne published this book, which describes a model for understanding how people interrelate. The book includes a series of mind games, patterns of superficially plausible activity that appears normal to bystanders, or even those taking part, but which conceals hidden motivations and which leads to well-defined predictable outcomes, which are nevertheless often counterproductive. I suggest that when considering culture, we should be mindful of this axiom. Underpinning the approach to assessing and managing culture is the idea that people rationally choose how they behave at work. It is rational for me to support my boss. It is rational for me to cooperate with my colleagues. But I may not want to. I may not agree with them. I may have no strong views, be happy to go with the flow. People don't behave naturally at work. We see this in phenomena like silent insubordination or faux respect for those with senior titles. We see it in heuristics like, well, she's a director so she must know what she's talking about. Or he's really bright. He runs a mean valuation, so I shouldn't question. The importance for corporate culture 
is the difference between what we think and feel compared with what we say and do. I'm reminded of the Upton Sinclair quotation, it's hard to get someone to believe something when their salary depends on them not believing it. This may go some way to explaining why well-meaning but essentially meaningless corporate culture statements tend to go unchallenged by even intelligent, interested people. There's no kudos in making the challenge. It feels like unfair criticism. What do I know anyway? Everyone else does it this way. Maybe I'm the one who's missing something. Ultimately, there tends to be little, if any, accountability for the end result anyway. It's easier to tolerate the nonsense. So what is this simple, practical approach to assessing culture? There are five questions asked in structured interviews with employees. The first three, the starting point, are the core questions to be asked not in a survey, but in probing face-to-face -face interviews. Surveys are poor at gathering qualitative data of the type required and can be susceptible to unconscious influence by sponsoring firms. Using the three core questions, employees describe their firm's culture in ways that professional managers can, or think they can, influence, direct and control. The aim is to view culture through the lens of, professional management, of the professional management toolkit and thus get some clues about what management needs to do next. By observing the impact of management, we can feed back to manage differently to get a different result. The fourth question identifies where power to drive culture lies. Employees are asked to shade their answers to the core questions in this light. I suggest that for a given employee, your cultural cues will primarily come from the person who you deem to have the most control over your livelihood or comfort. And there is a fifth question, which we'll come to shortly. Looking at culture through the lens of management action, the constituents of a culture can best be described by asking employees the following. Easy one, obvious, interesting to see how answers differ when you ask what the CEO rewards as distinct from what your department head rewards or what your immediate boss rewards. This one is more nuanced. If you have the complete pool of possible management action before you and you separate out the parts of management that involve reward, you're left with things like performance management, decision making, de decision -making development, all the hard day-to-day -day stuff of management. How is that applied in your firm? And this is the interesting third question. It is impossible to manage everything in a knowledge-based organisation. What is left to managers, supervisors, team leaders or employees to sort out for themselves? Sometimes areas of firms aren't managed because it's just too hard or the people involved wouldn't stand it. But as we'll, as, uh, we'll describe later, they may well be the areas that significantly drive culture. All of these questions might have more than one answer, depending what level of the organisation is being asked about. It's important to identify how the different levels in the management hierarchy affect how the firm is run. What does the CEO reward as distinct from your line manager? And which is more important to you? I'll talk a little later about each question. For the moment, it's important to recognise that the questions are not asked to draw out emotions and feelings. They are designed to be hard-edged, to require factual answers. What is rewarded, not how do you feel? Can you give me an example of that? Not do you like your manager? This is deliberate because the questions are designed to probe actual incidents of management action or inaction. Once a firm understands the impacts of its management, it can choose whether or not and how to vary management interaction. 
The fourth question is about power. This shades the answers to the three questions. It ranks them, if you will. The culture of a team could be primarily determined by the board or CEO, but it might also be determined by the team leader or the department head or by someone else. How people respond at work depends on who they're dealing with and how their relative power is judged. If my boss has the power to hire and fire, to praise and grumble, and she or he exercises that prerogative regularly, then my boss pretty much has my attention, pretty much exclusively, regardless of the latest boardroom pronouncement on culture. And if my boss is a bully or a grammar Nazi, or doesn't care much about finishing work because something new's come along, I'll fit in with that view of the world. My work culture and that of my teammates will norm to survive in this cultural bubble. The prevailing culture cannot be understood without recognising the power drivers, the perspective, if you like, of individual employees who are in the culture. So to understand culture, the three questions have to be answered within the broader question of where power resides in the organisation and how employees perceive it to be exercised as it affects them. Considering the three questions in a little more detail, we started today by asking what can management do to understand and direct culture? Logically, management can only affect culture by their actions. I've split management action into reward and the rest. I've also identified the complement, what management chooses not to do, the yang to the ying. Reward is perhaps the easiest and most obvious part of management. It's a pleasure to have to consider how to reward people for their part in an organisation's success. It's also the focus of much regulatory interaction on culture in considering incentives. The problem with incentive schemes from a culture perspective is that they tend to be really lucrative for just a few. Where the many are included, the rewards tend to be more modest and fall perhaps more out of the direct control of the recipients. Their influence on overall culture is minimal. Ask a middle-ranking employee what is rewarded and she or he will tell you. They'll tell you the real story, not the tale told in the report and accounts. It's all about sales. It's all about Project Y. It's all about the dividend. It's about my boss looking good. It's about customer service. Then ask how what's rewarded differs by perspective, by level. What does the board reward? What's rewarded in the division? What do your bosses reward? Ask for examples hard details, evidence. Then, ask who is the person most able, most likely, to reward you? Who is it most worth pleasing? And what does that person want to see? This is the power question. Regulators appear to view incentives as the primary driver of culture. Yet for the areas covered by these three questions, I think what is, re what is rewarded is the least relevant, the weakest lever in driving culture. What is managed is largely about improving performance by outcome, contribution or attitude or dealing with poor performance. <coughs> Excuse me. Originally, this question was what is punished because asking that of an employee is instructive. What behaviour incurs retaliation, be it formal or informal. What is punished certainly sends strong cultural messages. <coughs> I updated it to management because there's so much more to management than just reward and punishment. And the application of the whole suite of management process does drive culture to an extent. Power is important here too. Is the appraisal system important because my boss thinks it is, or because the board does? Does my pay depend on its results, or on how helpful the CEO finds me? What is managed is more relevant to culture than what is rewarded, 
because it's easier, I suggest, to keep a job than it is to excel at one. It is a broader part of the pyramid because it makes a greater contribution to culture. Finally, outside of all the incentive schemes and the management of performance, operations, etc., for most people, there is a degree of autonomy in their work. Provided they hit the established buttons, people are left to get on with it. And it's here that culture really flourishes. Left to their own devices, people will naturally and rationally arrange their work to suit themselves. This is where no one is looking. This is where practices build up and are extended outside the realm of formal management. As a result, culture thrives and multiplies in the gaps left by formal structures. Does culture expand to fill the spaces left by management? This might explain why good things can happen where management is poor. We recognise that poor practice can develop where oversight is weak, yet often ignore the idea that good things can flourish, regardless of management, rather than as a direct consequence of it. Power is important here too. A really solid, professional, high-quality ethical colleague can drive standards in every respect far higher than those that management actually requires, in ways that a board may not even have to contemplate. This is culture making in action. I contend that what is ignored, either on purpose or by accident, is the greatest driver of culture. And this is why it's so hard to direct. Turning to practicalities, I'm suggesting that culture is most meaningfully assessed by holding face-to-face, one-to-one meetings with employees. The meetings have to be led by a trusted third party who is probably deemed to be independent. I'd love to believe that employees in a firm could be so open with their management or HR teams that such discussions could be held within the firm. But given the realities of the game of work, I just don't think that that's possible. The questions, which at a high level I've mentioned, need to press for examples of things that have happened that allowed the interviewee to reach the conclusion that they did. The purpose of the questions is not to find out opinions, it is to establish details of actions and their perception. As a result, it's possible that in causing employees to reflect on their experiences, their perception changes. This is completely contrary to the ethics of most culture exercises, which, like journalism, seek to explain without disturbing. But this is not an academic exercise. If reflection embeds a culture, that's part of the culture management process. Whether you interview all employees or just a sample really depends on the numbers of people involved. Ideally, you'd want to view across sites, departments, and in theory, power brokers. It may be that successive exercises are carried out involving the same employees, year to year. Thus, there is the chance to identify what has changed. The required outcome is a short summary of the culture. Let's look at some hypothetical examples. These are possible extracts from the summaries of culture that might emerge from interviews using the four questions. This is hopefully a familiar one. I'd like to think that as managers of actuaries, we'd always be focused on rewarding insight. And while it would be nice to think that actuarial teams were self-organizing, I have to admit I've come across some that needed a little more structure. But this is a view of what might come out. Is the chief actuary's opinion more important to an actuarial student than that of the CEO? The chief actuary can fire you tomorrow. The CEO may not even know you exist. Does that affect culture? I'll leave you to consider that. Do these organisations still exist? After 10 years or so of TCF and the conduct agenda, we would hope not, but I wonder. Wouldn't you like to know if this is what employees really thought? Or actually, given the four questions asked, would you like to have evidence of behaviours that support this view? What if, despite the board's efforts, 
This was still what employees thought. Does that have a bearing on culture? Is this what might be identified in the report into what went wrong, if it ever gets that far? This is an example of an organisation with no front-facing role that's very much about box ticking and keeping the board and audit teams off everyone's backs. Yet if you received this report as a director, you'd be concerned. Given the wealth of regulation that's been shoveled onto financial services firms in recent years, just getting through it is hard enough. Tick box compliance is the opposite of what's required. But if that's what your people feel you are managing for, that has to be a concern. To receive this report, employees would have had to have given examples of work being done for the sake of it, regardless of fitness for purpose or quality. Just get something out for the board on Thursday. They would have described activity to satisfy management regardless of quality. I'm not sure an employee engagement survey would ever give results like this. Yet the matters being raised, they are important. Can you imagine this being shared with the board? Would it make them question how the business was being run? In the reports we see following financial scandals, there are always good, conscientious people who saw the seeds of situations emerging but kept their head down. They knew the culture and the risks that were being run. <clears throat> How about this? Imagine if this was shared with a regulator. There can be a demand for happy reporting. Boards want more and more thicker board packs to satisfy their reg regulatory obligations. But possibly uh, unconsciously, they don't want anything that causes them to think too hard or to doubt. I'm making up these examples for dramatic effect. But the four questions might, in the hands of a suitably qualified and independent questioner, lead to this sort of input. And if this is a genuine reflection of a real-world situation. Firms should know. I started to think a little more widely. Schooling in Finland is renowned throughout the world. There is very little bureaucracy. The focus is the child, and teachers are encouraged and empowered to take all steps they deem necessary to create a better educated child. In terms of what's managed and the subsequent description of culture, this might emerge. I have a weakness for expensive uh, nights out. What's great about these establishments, apart from the food, is the attention to every aspect of the customer experience. Yet, having spoken to managers, including HR people, at some of these restaurants, their problems are exactly the same as for any high street restaurant. Hiring the right people, making sure they turn up on time, ensuring uniforms are clean, stopping the fighting. What's different is the culture, the culture that the restaurant's senior staff maintain through their management. Finally, I wanted to reinforce the idea that good things can happen in unpleasant cultures. I don't know what the culture at Apple was like under Steve Jobs. But no one shirks from recognising, perhaps even revelling, in the fact that Steve Jobs could be quite unpleasant to work for. Since preparing these slides, I came across a presentation by John Timpson, who is the, um, uh, on the board of Timpson's, the company that does key cutting and shoe repairs in, in towns and cities up and down the UK. It's very, and the way he describes his approach to running the business uh, and c the culture of the business fits neatly into this, this sort of framework. Um, as far as reward is concerned, uh, Timson have an incentive calculation, a percentage of sales, less expenses, which is shared with uh, all members of the organisation depending on service, etc. When it comes to management, John Timson says he has just two rules. 
uh, you must wear the uniform and you must put the money in the till. He then talks about everything else being left entirely to the people, usually individuals, running the Timson store. So pricing in a Timson store is at the complete discretion of the person doing the work. Uh, he, he, he talks about how when he introduced this, uh, he faced significant cultural blockades because people didn't, simply didn't believe him. He had to go out on a massive change program t to get the people in the stores to understand that they could choose how much to charge. And if somebody only had five pounds, then that was fine, all those sorts of things. It's available on YouTube. It's uh, well worth a, uh, a look. I'm trying to bring to life how the idea might work, how it might provide genuine insight to inform management action about culture. But is it a viable alternative to what we do currently? What is apparent is that the results of the four questions may not be welcome. Do firms really want to know how employees judge their culture? Might the results be a surprise, an irritation? If culture is important, then understanding it is important. If it isn't, perhaps you can save money and time by not pursuing feel-good approaches which have no record of success, or at least do them with your eyes open. Now for the fifth question. When I consider the various financial services scandals that we've all lived through, I can't think of a question involving culture that I could reasonably ask of those involved at the time with an expectation that the bad behaviour would have been stopped. Which makes the focus on culture feel a little pointless. But I think there may be a different question that could go some way to resolving this dilemma. If people were asked whether their conscience was troubled by anything at work, I wonder whether the answers would have been different. Is it okay that Nick Leeson's accounts haven't been checked by the back office? Asked as a cultural question, might solicit the response, oh, we don't get on his bad side. He's really clever. Do you know how much he earned last year? And these answers may culturally be deemed reasonable. Ask, does that trouble your conscience? And there's room for a different conversation. Well, I am meant to check everyone's accounts every day, so I would prefer to if I could. Another example, is it okay to design systems that falsify emissions data? Well, everybody does it. Does that trouble your conscience? Might invoke a different response. I say might. These things are easy after the event. But conscience is a different thing to culture. Culture is the water we swim in. But conscience is about where we swim, who with, and with what end in sight. Conscience is highly personal. It allows us to call out seemingly small things. Because it's so personal, it's not subject to anyone's whim or opinion. It is yours. In summary, by tethering culture to management action, by viewing it through this lens, Culture can be described in terms of what management does. This is achieved by understanding the perception of what management rewards and manages, and by what it chooses not to do. The approach recognises who the cultural power brokers are. The icing on the cake comes about by asking about conscience, which might provide a handy list of areas in which management might like to drive culture. To manage a culture, you have to have a good idea what outcomes you're looking for. The five questions provide a guide to outcomes from management action. What do you want the answers to be? The board should define the outcomes it wants to see from the application of its management practices in a way that allows its required culture to emerge. And it's not just about definition, it's about checking the results against those expected, 
and what action you take if there's a big difference. <coughs> Excuse me. In terms of reward, the board will typically delegate much, if not all, of this work to the CEO and the CEO's team, except, of course, for any high-level incentive schemes. To be effective, rewards have to reflect organisational structures, so there should be some sensitivity to teams and departments and business units, their plans and motivations. If you can't recognise and reward your values, your culture, say integrity, innovation, customer service, etc., how can you manage them into your culture? The board should be critically interested in the results of their reward mechanisms. Stepping back, I wonder if this is just too much, too intrusive, crossing the line between management and oversight. If it is, and it does feel heavy, we should ask ourselves, how is the board to be assured about culture through reward? The payout from an incentive scheme just doesn't seem to do it somehow. Management training needs to be designed to develop the cultural perspectives that the firm believes are appropriate. Doesn't this happen already? Possibly. There are um, firms that tailor their training to their values, but that can sometimes come across as a little contrived. It might be interesting to consider what an employee's experience should be and tailor training to match that from a cultural perspective. Choosing not to specify aspects of a firm's operation feels wrong in today's control-focused, risk-averse, transparent culture. Economist John Kay noted in his book, Other People's Money, that the public clamours for transparency when trust fails. Perhaps what is ignored is where trust resides, where professionals, experts, technicians and practitioners are expected to do their best work without excessive oversight or intrusion. The often cited difficulties of change management might arise when something is being moved from the being ignored category to the being managed category. You could imagine that in these circumstances people might react badly. Power is an interesting one. I remember being told by a business school lecturer that when a new CEO arrives to shake up a firm, she or he typically fires the top level of management. That's a dramatic way to ensure that you're evidently the most powerful person in the room. Yet it's an inherently one-dimensional approach in a world of increasing complexity. If tone from the top doesn't work, what does? How do you identify the power brokers and ensure that their message is the appropriate one? These are not trivial questions. How would you react to conscience reporting in a firm? I think this is an area where transparency may be useful. If a Volkswagen engineer felt uncomfortable optimising the performance of an engine to secure better test results, she or he might face a range of objections. Everybody does it. Everyone knows the tests are meaningless, and so on. But if the explanations for conscience-rousing behaviour were to be made public, would that change the perception of the issue? So Volkswagen can publish that it works to optimise the results of the diesel emissions tests in ways that may not reflect the day-to-day -day usage of the car. What would the reaction be? Maybe the industry would start to consider more appropriate tests. If conscience is to play a part, the board should be interested in management's response to any issues that are highlighted. I came across the idea of a red button the other day, which was a way to empower any employee to raise an issue that might be a future dramatic threat. The red button was a hotline to the CEO's desk, with mandatory reporting on the issue to the board. If anyone would like to discuss what I've talked about today in more detail, or would like to read some more, I've written a short paper which is freely available. By way of summary, the call for us to attend our, to our culture 
is not going away. Yet it's hard to find an approach that feels like it will genuinely address the issues being highlighted. Having done this work and stepping back and looking at the big picture, I wonder if the best summary conclusion is that culture actually depends on the quality of your middle management. Sir Stanley Carms, who ran Dixon's, for the high street retailer, for many years, was asked when he would stop opening new stores. He responded by saying, when we run out of people, good people, who want to manage them. He said that Dixon's had run numerous studies to try and identify what made a good store. And the answer was, head and shoulders above all other considerations, the quality of the manager. A good manager knows how to reward, how to use the management toolkit, and what latitude to allow those that will use it to good advantage. In one way, this is an obvious conclusion. In another, perhaps it does suggest that our efforts to address culture should be focused differently. Thank you very much for your time. Um, do you think culture is subjective, is there, or is there some kind of universally agreed culture standard? I, I'm, I think the big problem is that there is no common definition or, or, or standard. So, so what I've sought to do is, is almost reverse engineer a definition based around what managers can actually do. Um, and in considering what managers can actually do to affect culture, I identified this void, which was what managers ignore, but good people around fill the gaps, or bad people fill the gaps. Uh, is this, um, I guess, as actuaries then, what, why actuaries? How, how can we play a bigger role in making this change? Uh, yeah. <laughs> why actuaries? <laughs> um, uh, mainly because I'm an actuary and, and I, I was fed up sitting in meetings uh, or reading and listening to people talking about culture and the, the discussions didn't bear any um, resemblance to what I was experiencing. And I'm an actuary so I've got to talk to other actuaries who at least will tell me if I'm talking rubbish fairly quickly. Well, I guess you, could you say that actuaries share um, maybe some level of common culture in that we are numerically driven to a certain extent. Um. The, the, I, I'm amazed at how different individual actuaries can be. Yeah. So yes, we have a, we have a common base, um, but uh, yeah, there, there are actuaries right well on the scale, I would say. There was Almost a, any dimension you could think of. There's a, there's a comment here um, as well from someone in the crowd that uh, on your slide where you showed the um, mission statements of the FTSE 100 companies mm -hmm. and how some of them were very, very similar. Do you think that's a good thing? No, I think that's a, a, it's a, a board-driven response to public pressure that, that doesn't actually achieve very much. It's, uh, okay. That's why I find frustrated. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, what company doesn't have innovation as one of its values? And yet, uh, I remember... Um, uh, looking after an actuarial team when innovation came out as one of the new corporate values and, and I said anybody who innovates with Solvency 2 has to leave today. So uh, we, we have to do our job in a different way. Well. They just, innovation just doesn't apply to everybody. So it can do, you can, you can twist it and, and force it into a box but that seems like, like an awful lot of work just to try and say you've satisfied something that never really meant anything anyway. Yeah, I, 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 sort of, I can see where you're coming from. I guess culture to my mind is a very slow moving thing and when you have a culture at workplace yeah i mean arguably allow it to grow and uh, for the employees to, to to embrace that culture and do you think i guess you're saying you're suggesting that a more proactive approach is um, appropriate well I, i'm sort of saying either we manage culture or we don't if we manage culture what are the tools we have at our disposal? And it's reward and then all the other the, the management things. So we're using those tools, what impact are they having? And if they're not having the right impact, then let's change what we do. 
Of course, the, the second question that I talked about was if they're making no difference at all, then we, we should admit it and, and move on. The culture is a very important thing. <clears throat> it's everywhere. Uh, see. Uh, well, it, it's, it, it, it's a very important thing, um, and, but can you manage it? It's not, I don't think anyone's questioning whether culture is important or, or, or exists, but can you manage it? Mm -hmm. Can you assess it? And if you can't, where does that leave you? Do you think the uh, toolkits available are different for a company of, say, five versus a FTSE 100 company? I mean, you hear of stories where, say, for example, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg takes a very proactive approach. Every Friday, there's a town hall. He discusses issues with employees. Is that something that companies, larger companies, should move towards? It's obviously something which smaller companies can do quite easily. Yeah, I, I, I don't know enough to say what might work in a, in a particular circumstance. Um, but, but I question whether um, is the town hall just something which happens and um, by the time you're doing the fourth one of the year, half the people don't turn up. And, and, you know, is it really driving culture or is it the person who's leading your team who needs something out by next Friday that's on your back that's driving your particular culture? Got any? Uh, we've got a few more questions. Um, how can someone outside an organisation get an idea of the culture? Oh, it's it's uh, very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> how, how would you know? Because you're you're facing the presentation that the organisation makes of itself. Uh, I think it's even difficult for boards, you know, non-executives who may turn up to you know, ten meetings a year in the head office, um, they, they make efforts to go and, and meet people on, sort of on the shop floor as it were. Um, but whether they really understand culture, I, I think uh, it's hard to know. I think maybe this is something which Colin pointed out earlier on about collaboration between different uh, areas. Uh, mm. Is that something which you think should be more actively promoted then? Oh yeah, no, I mean yeah. obviously uh, I've, I've come up with this, this approach which I shared with the, the, the CRO group originally just to get a feel for whether there was an interest in, in uh, um, talking about this t to other people. So I'm very happy to, very happy to share with, with anybody who's interested. Great. Um, there's a question on your equation, culture <laughs> multiplied by action equals outcome. I shouldn't really call it an equation. I'm very <laughs> embarrassed by it. What defines a good outcome and who should define it? Um, that's a um, that's a, a question that just points at the inadequacy of the equation to actually exist in that format. Um, I, I think the, the point was that that if bad things happen, um, it may happen because the culture was poor, but it may happen also because an individual rose above the culture. Um, uh, so I don't think it's it, it's it's almost a. I'm trying to separate the culture from individual action. Yeah, that's you're, all you're that's not a, saying someone is personally responsible. <clears throat> um, I guess, can you, this a very good question here on uh, regulators, can you say a little more uh, about how you think regulators could and maybe should change their focus on cultures? I mean, you talk about incentives as the main tool. Is there anything else they could they use? They should adopt this approach <laughs> immediately. Okay. It's, I'm very happy to consult with them on, on uh, yeah. Uh, regula regulation and culture is interesting. The, um, uh, at the central bank in Ireland, they were very concerned about culture. Um, and they had a, um, a psychologist thinking about ways to assess the culture of, of firms. Um, so I, I had a meeting with her and I said, do you think we should address the bank's culture before we talk to firms about what their culture should be? And uh, she had the good grace to look embarrassed and we moved swiftly. <laughs> um, it's, uh, I know that I think in Holland um, they have, uh, I think, psychologists observing board meetings mm -hmm. and trying to judge the, the health of the board. Um, and health is measured in terms of? I think all sorts of, like the degree of discussion and, and probing and challenge, all those sorts of things. It, and that, that feels plausible, but I think it only takes one of those firms to fail and the whole approach will be called, caused into, call, will be called into question. And I don't think culture is about the boardroom. Um, a tone from the top has its place, but it's what's going on in the middle of the organisation that, that is really going to make, a dif really going to make the difference if, if there is malfeasance. And maybe we can zoom out. One of the questions here then is, um, have you looked at the national le uh, level, sort of applying your framework at the government uh, level? 
No, I, I'm, just, I'm basically, here's some ideas, as, as uh, Colin said, it's thought leadership in, in perhaps a, a field that's slightly different from, from uh, typical actuarial fields. And, you know, I'm, it's an idea I'm sharing it with some people. If it's rubbish, I'll, I'll be told. If, if it has a life, I'm happy to talk to people about it. I guess the so. more and more people who adopt this change, mm -hmm. that would naturally build up. We'll find out whether it works or not. Right because it, it may not, and as I say, if it draws us closer to the conclusion that you can't manage culture, that's also a good thing. Because we can stop worrying about it and having free fruit on Fridays and all that sort of thing. I like my free fruit on Fridays. Sorry? <laughs> well, I have it for a different reason, not because of culture. Um, there was a comment or a request. Uh, could you move this slide to uh, the reference to your uh, paper so people can take it down? Sorry. Oh. I could, but I can't control it. Okay. Um, we'll probably share it after this um, session. A um, couple of final questions, I guess. Um, do you think employees resent management due to equality gap widening? Sorry, Sam. Do you think that employees resent management due to uh, an in, an, uh, gap widening in the equality between employees and management? I think it strikes at the integrity of attempts to, to manage culture because the, the, you have the, the usual values of creativity, innovation, respect, customer service, all, all those sorts of things. Um, and then it's easy to cast um, behaviour of the, the highest paid people in an organisation in a poor light in any of those dimensions based on probably quite trivial incidents. So it gives people a reason to say, oh yes, but they're not really living the, living the values. And then the whole thing, if it doesn't have integrity, it just dies. But how much of this is also incentives? You've got different incentives for the highest paid and yeah. the very low paid. Yeah. And obviously that could be addressed to try and reduce the gap. It, it could be, but I'm not sure there's, there's any drive to do that. I think incentives at the current levels are here to stay um, for the moment, whatever we think about them. Um, and the culture of organisations will still exist and it still needs managing or not managing. Okay. Because we still need to take steps to prevent um, uh, you know, f uh, financial issues that, uh, that we've seen. I guess really the, the, the first bit is to try and understand what the culture is within the firm and that's what you've, you've yeah. proposed with your, yeah. your framework. And do you think that a, a North European model uh, to business ownership by employees would be more conducive to cultural change? Uh, I think it depends what, what you mean by business, uh, by ownership, by employees. There are a number of, of um, I think I saw research that said for sort of share schemes where employees accrue shares, um, the vast majority of employees cash them in on the first opportunity. So they're not seeing ownership as, as being part of something, they're seeing um, ownership as, well it's part of the benefits package and I'll bank it as soon as I can. Right. Ownership with sort of workers on, on um, boards and things, I could see how that, that might make a difference. And it uh, gives them a mm. stronger voice if anything. Yeah, yeah. And, and it makes it more collaborative and more uh, um, uh, <coughs> more, more feeling of ownership, uh, which I think does affect culture. I think right. If people feel they own the, the business then that, yeah, that would make a difference. Super. Thank you very much for your questions. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Please join me again in thanking Paul.